Have you ever wondered where you really stand with God? Are you overcome with feelings of guilt because of things you've done wrong? Are you tired of religion that focuses on rules that you can't keep? Have we got good news for you? It's time to listen in on some casual conversation with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski and discover what true freedom is all about. This is Growing in Grace. Growing in Grace with Mike and Joel. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Growingingrace.org. You'll find all of our past podcasts on there. What is this podcast about? (laughs) Well, it's supposed to be about Jesus and what he did for us. Not so much about you and me and what we're supposed to do for him. I found it interesting. I believe it was uh, Andrew Farley who said, I haven't checked the math on this, Joel, but I found it interesting that I think there's 60% more references to us being in Christ than Christ being in us. And I, I think that's interesting. The, the phrase in Christ is is one that um, you'll begin to notice as you grow in grace, as you, as you research the scriptures. Yeah, isn't that something else? That we weren't just left alone to try to live up to some standard, but God <laughs> placed us in Christ, in Christ in us too. I mean, it's it's this, I have died and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We just kind of maybe skim by that, you know, sometimes. it's That's Galatians 2.20. And we think, oh, well, that's neat. That's nice. That's just a nice Christian saying, I died, I no longer live. But it's reality. It's the truth. That's what really happened. God just didn't say, well, I need to find a way to help these people to follow my laws. You know, he didn't just say, I'm going to do what I can to get them to live better. No, he took away the whole thing about us trying to live better. (laughs) He replaced it with the life of Christ. (laughs) Isn't that something else? Uh, what God has done for us. So uh, it's good news all the way around. And uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about this if you're concerned that we're saying it's not about what we do for God. We'll keep on listening and uh, we'll hopefully, and, and, and you know, I say that with a little bit of sarcasm, but you know, hopefully we'll actually really bring out the truth from the scriptures uh, that talk about all this. Well, hopefully, um, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, Let's talk about the law a little bit more, Joel, because I know we were covering it during the Sermon on the Mount the past couple of weeks or so, and and, um, I I think sometimes, uh, especially those who are opposed to this thing that they refer to as hyper-grace or free grace, unlimited grace, cheap grace, whatever they want to call it, there seems to be such a fear out there among religionists who just have such a concern about grace, and and it's really, it, it astounds me frankly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it helped us, uh, Joel and I, to, to begin to see the perspective and the context of uh, Jew and, and Gentile and the, the two covenants being the old and the new. And I think back, I don't even have it in front of me, Joel, but I think back to uh, Hebrews chapter 8, when, when God said, you know, speaking to, to Israel to begin with, and then we, we became a part of the new covenant too, but he said, I, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. And it's not going to be like the covenant that I had with your fathers. It's going to be a whole different thing. It's going to be a different thing. And then he went on to say, I'm going to write my laws upon your hearts and on your minds. And people automatically assume he's talking about the law of Moses. But again, like I pointed out recently, the law is a package. Not only the Ten Commandments, but another 600 plus laws on top of that. And they're all together. You don't divide them up. As we said back in in, in Deuteronomy, God said you will not add to or take away from this law. It's a package deal. It's a bundle, like what your cable TV company offers. They they offer the the bundle. The problem is this bundle with the law offered no savings whatsoever. Yeah, it came with absolutely no life. It was good. You know, we tried to point out in the last few weeks, the law is good. The law is good and just and holy. We uphold the law. But what do we mean by that? (laughs) We mean by upholding the law. We mean to say that the law is so good and just and holy. And as you say, Cap, as a package, as an entire deal, because even in Deuteronomy 27, it says, Cursed is anyone who does not uphold the words of this law by carrying them out. Then all the people shall say, Amen. It was a package deal, the whole law. And, you know, we're told a couple times in the New Testament that if, if you keep one law, or if you keep all the law, 
but you fail in just one point, you're guilty of all. So it is, it's a package deal. And not just the Ten Commandments, but there were 613 of them. And so it's pretty serious stuff when you start saying that as Christians we're supposed to keep the law. Because, again, there are 613 of them. If you, According to the law itself, if you don't uphold all of them, you are cursed. And so fortunately, Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law, not just, you know, some people will say, well, Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law, but we're still supposed to follow it. But when we mess up, we're just not cursed anymore. But really, the curse of the law was that if you don't uphold all of it, then you shall die. You shall surely die. And, and so the thing is, that first covenant, it had glory. Paul writes about the the glory of the first covenant. But like you said, Cap, this new covenant, this second covenant, which for us Gentiles is the only one, but this new covenant is not like the old one. The old one is the law. It's a covenant of the law. You do it or you're cursed. The new covenant is no matter what you've ever done, Christ and his sacrifice, his perfection You receive his righteousness by grace simply because you believe, by grace through faith. That's different. Those two things are different. (laughs) The old covenant, or the new covenant, is an old covenant part two. It's not like God said, okay, there's this old covenant of all these laws, and I'm going to put this new covenant in place, and we're going to mix these two things together so that they'll just find a new way in this new covenant to follow those old covenant laws. No, he said, you die to the law and then you, you find life in Jesus Christ. So they're not mixture, they're, they're not mixed, there's not a mixture, they're completely separate and totally, completely different things. A lot of good stuff that you just said in there, and, and the fact that the laws that are written on our hearts, not the law, but the laws, are the law of faith, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of liberty, for example. We, we now operate by the ministry of the Spirit, which is in contrast to the ministry of the law that came from Moses. Moses tends to, and it still happens today, when Moses is read, people are blinded. There's a veil put over, and then when the, Jesus is, is taught and the ministry of the Spirit flows, then the veil is removed, and the fruit of the Spirit begins to flow. But God said, I will remember their sins no more. Well, if he was talking about writing the law of Moses on our hearts, that's 613 laws that you would have to abide by. All of that would be in there, and you'd be avoiding all these things for the diet, and you would be requiring different things in regards to ceremonial stuff. And, and God, you see that the law was given to remind us of sin. I mean, that's what it did. The law reminded people of there was a, it brought a, a, a guilty conscience and it brought a reminder of sin. So God just contradicted himself in that passage that was taken from Jeremiah that we find in Hebrews 8. He would have contradicted himself if he was talking about the law of Moses being written on our hearts because he just went, finished off that passage with saying, oh, by the way, in this new covenant, I'm not going to remember your sins anymore. It wasn't that way under the old. And I love what you brought out in in Galatians there with what Paul said about being under a curse. And of course, the the good news is that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, which required that all of it be followed. And I hear people today say, well, you know, the Ten Commandments or the Nine or whatever it is that they follow these days, uh, they're still in place. But the ceremonial and the civil aspects, the sacrificial part of the law, that, that, that was done away with. I've got this to say, for legalists and organized religion, shame on you for breaking up the law and not holding it in high esteem by taking a black highlighter to 93% of it and somehow saying that this still applies and we need to follow this. That is so wrong when it comes to the two covenants. Don't you understand that the whole law was a package that was meant to be held together? Uh, and we're not, it's, I like what you said, Joel. We're, we're not against the law. We recognize it for what it is and we are humbled by it. But um, as, as Paul said, he needed to be delivered from thou shall not because thou shall not caused him to covet more than he more than he could have imagined. Every kind of coveting occurred when the commandment came. So we needed to be delivered from that, but not only delivered from, but delivered into the ministry of the Spirit. Right. That's the thing. That's the whole thing about 
about the law. You know, Paul, Paul said a lot of stuff about the law. He was a Jew himself. He was a Pharisee. Paul knew the law. <laughs> and if there was anybody who could tell us about the law, it was Paul. And here's what he says, you know, some more stuff from uh, Galatians 3, uh, starting at verse 19. Because what, what is the purpose of the law then? We understand that the law had a purpose. We uphold that purpose. So Paul says, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, so it was added because of sin, uh, till, I like to highlight that word, till the seed should come, that's Jesus Christ, to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Uh, now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. And he goes on here, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. So we're not saying that the law is against the promises of God, but he says here, for if, if there had been a law which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture, he's talking about the old covenant scriptures, uh, the scripture has confined all under sin. That's what the law did. It confined everybody under sin, not under righteousness, not under life, but under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So you see that? The law was given to confine people under sin. It showed them their sin. It showed them their guilt, and it made them guilty, so that in Christ— through faith in Christ, the promise uh, might be received and, and it might be given to those who believe. He goes on, but before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. It was to bring us to Christ that we might be justified, again, not by law, but by faith. And after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So we see the purpose of the law. It was to confine people under sin and to lead to Christ. It was put there until Christ came. And now that we have faith in Christ, we're no longer under that tutor. Its job is done. And now we go ahead and live our lives of faith. Man, that's good stuff. I wish you could just repeat all that over again. Um, and, and I love the slam dunk. It's basketball season as we're, we're uh, recording this, getting ready for March Madness or whatever in college basketball. But you just gave a slam dunk there, or Paul did, in, in Galatians 3. If a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness indeed would have been based on the law. But now we know from what Paul told us in Romans that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all who believe. So do you see the transition? Uh, even though we as Gentiles were never under the law, we became a part of the new covenant because of God's unconditional love for us. Uh, the, the doors became open wide to us. But whether Jew, Gentile, or anything in between, if that's possible, you, you've gone from law to Christ. There's no balance here between the two. Yeah, you're either under one or you're under the other. And the good news is that by faith in Jesus Christ, we are under this new covenant uh, where we have righteousness, justification, life, and everything else according to God's promises by grace through faith. This has been Growing in Grace with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski. Heard online through various internet sources around the world each week. To access hundreds of past programs, visit graceroots.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace.